Good afternoon, everyone. We're ready to get started. Thank you for joining the World Affairs Council Upstate today for Let's Get Business Moving, a new plan for supply chain innovation. The World Affairs Council Upstate is a program of Upstate International. We're a nonpartisan, nonpolitical opportunity for you to engage in global issues that affect us here at home every day. If you haven't checked out the World Affairs Council Upstate, I invite you to do so by going to our website at upstateinternational.org. This is just one of a series of supply chain events we've hosted recently. I'd like to thank up front our media sponsor, Upstate Business Journal, for their support of these events, and also the Upstate South Carolina Alliance and the European American Chamber of Commerce Carolinas, who are our co-hosts on not only this event, but many of our Global Business Connections event opportunities. Today, we'll be talking about what matters most to businesses and people who live in South Carolina in regards to our industry. Automotive, aerospace, and advanced materials have a huge impact on our bottom line here every day for South Carolina and its citizens. Not only are they um, impactful economically, but they are impactful internationally in the innovation they bring. We've heard a lot about the challenges recently during COVID, you know, economic downturns, um, talent attraction difficulties. But what we aren't hearing enough about is the way South Carolina is leading the industry moving forward. So we're gonna focus on a solutions approach today. And I'd like to um, first introduce our moderator who will be helping us um, take your questions and give them to our speakers. Suzanne Dickerson, who is with the South Carolina Council on Competitiveness, joined them in 2016 after serving for eight years as Director for International Business Development at Clemson University's International Center for Automotive Research, what we call ICAR. Suzanne's experience includes 20 years in the automotive industry. We've got someone here who really knows what we're talking about when we focus on our supply chain. She has 12 years within BMW working in the fields of corporate sustainability, innovation management, and long-term strategic and structural planning. Something very interesting to me though that I'd really like to tell you about Suzanne is the way she gives back to the community in other ways. Suzanne serves as a founding board member of the Multi-Southern Automotive Women's Forum and is a board member of the South Carolina Automotive Council. She also was recently awarded the very prestigious 2020 Charleston Woman of the Year Award from the Charleston Women in Trade Organization. I think that speaks volumes. And Suzanne, we appreciate so much you being here with us today. Um, not only for your expertise, but personally, because we really enjoy what you bring to these events. So Suzanne, I'm gonna hand it to you and ask that you introduce our speakers. Thank you, Tracy. I'm so excited to be here today. This is an excellent panel on a very timely and interesting topic. So thank you for inviting me to moderate this esteemed set of panelists. I would like to just, um, give the participants a little bit of an overview of how we've structured this. So we will be having each panelist give you a short overview. Um, a couple of them are actually even going to use some materials that you'll be able to see when they share their screens. And we have some macro and rather global um, topics that we want them to comment on initially. And then I'm going to take a little bit of a break in an effort to make this as interactive as possible. And we'll be asking some questions. So if you have uh, questions as we go through the very first part of this session today, please go ahead and submit them through the chat. And then we're going to dive a little bit deeper and into the solutions um, approach that the World Affairs uh, Council of the Upstate likes to take on these, and we'll be talking about the technical and the tactical um, technology focus areas um, of supply chain and getting some input from our panelists on that as well. So you'll have more than one opportunity to have your questions um, asked of the panelists. So keep, please keep them coming. 
I'd like to start with an introduction uh, to Dr. Nick Vias, who is an educator, thought leader, author, keynote speaker, ASQ fellow, and chair of the ASQ Lean Division and advisor to leaders in the worlds of supply chain practice and policy. As the executive director and founder of the Center for Global Supply Chain Management, and academic director of the University of South Carolina's Marshall Global Supply Chain Management Program, Dr. Bias educates the next generation of business leaders. In 2018, Dr. Bias was bestowed the Supply Chain Leader Award of Excellence by APEX, which is a professional membership organization I assume many of our attendees today are familiar with. It is the premier professional association for supply chain management. APIX recognized Dr. Bias for his work at USC Marshall, as well as his efforts with the Supply Chain Professionals Without Borders, an international initiative that he founded with an aim to share supply chain knowledge and resources with developing nations. Dr. Bias, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Suzanne, and a good day, everybody. Uh, I will go ahead and share my screen. So Suzanne mentioned, uh, I thought it would be useful for me to sort of give you a macro perspective. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So uh, as you can see, what I would like to do is sort of walk you through a macro perspective in the area of following. As we know, the supply chain has changed uh, post-COVID and during the COVID. So let's look at uh, impact of COVID. And this impact, let's focus on both supply side as well as demand side. Because if we look at it, the disruption that this pandemic has created globally, it's not only on the one side of the supply chain, but rather it's actually end-to-end. -end. So we'll talk about it. We'll look at some of the uh, supply chain network disruptions and how this will actually relate in terms of the trade and its implication. There is a tremendous shift in the trade policy and governance that we will see coming out of the post-COVID uh, world, especially in the Western democracies, uh, that that will be very uh, imperative to, for us to sort of touch on it. Uh, we already seen the social distancing and shelter in place in various degree, you know, in state by state. But leading up to how that has changed the unemployment, public health and food supply chain, leading into the human capital. This is a big area. Hopefully we'll get to talk about it and how we will have to be prepared as a country, as a society, of being able to train our workforce to take advantage of what I call the decoupling of supply chain. So this is a key word that I will try to touch on to giving you some trends that I feel that the post COVID, the world will be decoupled rather than deglobalized. And suddenly we'll try to see if I can bring this back to US perspective and to uh, South Carolina. So just a quick point I, I wanna share. Over the last 30 years, ir irrespective of political affiliation, we know that we created a global supply chain network, simply uh, cheaper, better, faster. In process of doing so, we become very single country centric, in this case, China centric supply chain network evolved out of it. It morphed to the point that almost majority of our supply chain nodes became China dependent. And when the disruption happened, it created a huge impact, right? Impact we saw back home here, we saw impact across the world. In fact, one can say over 181 countries out of 186 that we trade with has actually some impact of this disease in a various degree. Uh, what this has led is truly a global recession and we're in the middle of it. So if we look at it this from the disease standpoint, 
at the macro level, but let's just see our 50 states here, right? And what this tells you, and this data is as of uh, yesterday, I took this snapshot. And this just gives you per capita, 100,000 people, the number of cases, and we see various degrees of trends. Trends in some cases as inflection point has achieved and it's going down in other cases, you can see uh, we see some up tweaks in certain states, right? So there's a varying degree of number of incidents that we see. And this is important because this data point suggests how likely we'll continue to face the headwinds when we talk about the supply chain. So let's look at the first global impact on manufacturing, right? So various industry has focused and impact is different, but motor vehicles, general machinery, rail, shipbuilding, aerospace, followed by textile, fabricated metals and products. So today we're focusing on aerospace, advanced material and automobile. You can see in the data in terms of the shrinkage of industry, three of those industry have been impacted in upper Ashland. So what we see this disruption in the global manufacturing trend at the macro level, China has been able to somehow maneuver and seen the uptick in terms of the growth. The rest of the world is still trying to eke out of that. The way we can understand the impact is by looking at the dollars, market capitalization. And what we see here, and I wanna just focus on four key uh, area, commercial aerospace. As you saw, Boeing just announced that it will be a decade before they see the uptick on the booking orders. That's it, they're talk, you're talking about by the end of 2030, that outlook by Boeing that they made an announcement yesterday gives us the chilling effect of how long this can drag on. So headwind in areas of commercial aerospace, air travel, oil and gas, banks, automotive and assembly. And you can see this uh, in sort of a trend going all the way into where the less impact in the right hand side of the quadrant, high tech, uh, retail and pharma, especially online, uh, we will likely to see that similar impact. This is a global picture. We're likely to see this at back home. Again, to recap, hardest impact, commercial aerospace, air travel, oil and gas, automotive and insurance career. So this will continue to uh, impact on a supply chain. What we are likely to see that those industries, that they're digitally adopted, meaning they have digital maturity in their supply chain, has coped much better than those having a legacy systems. So this is incredible because you look at the market valuation, market reward for the market share and top line revenue growth. Those companies have fared very well and we'll continue to see a huge gap and gap being widening for those companies that are mature in digital front and those that they have not been able to take on to the journey. If you think about this from the ocean freight, right, we're expecting for almost close to 4% growth before COVID, right? The trade winds, were very much strong. Economy was in all cylinders. We're firing up. Uh, reshoring had started to happen. Onshoring and nearshoring was started to happen. But still, the trade winds were much more in a favorable status. If we look at it post outbreak, in my opinion, and if we decentralize and decoupled the supply chain, which is what I am proposing, my hypothesis is the supply chains of the yesterday will no longer be the supply chain of the future. We're likely to see close to 25 to 50% reduction in the flow of where those goods come from. And this will truly lead to some of the onshoring, nearshoring capabilities, we talked about it, impact on USMCAs, and some of the inner Asia's and other trade trends that we're seeing this, right? 
So let me just close out with a couple of few thoughts and then we'll get into it later on. But the human capital, here is my biggest concern that we often don't talk about. And being politically agnostic on this subject is how do we build a human capital to participate in the future, post-COVID supply chain, post-COVID employment, post-COVID economy. And mind you, there is an underlying trend that we see up to, to it on mental health issues, not only in the US, across the world of this pandemic, the isolation and segregation. And so if I think this is a topic that we need to address, not only as a state, as a country, but as a society as a whole, and see what this will lead up to it. So I wanted to sort of draw this picture uh, on, from the macro standpoint, and my colleagues here on the panel will continue to bring uh, sort of a micro perspective and we'll certainly talk about other issues during the Q&A session. So with that, Suzanne, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. It's very interesting. You know, we've, um, in every circle, you know, I'm sure that all of us have been discussing who are the winners and who are the losers, you know, in the, in the COVID uh, impact. And depending on uh, your perspective, um, you know, I've heard people in automotive say that uh, automotive is likely to end up being a winning uh, industry segment because as people consider uh, whether they feel safe flying, uh, they may decide to do, you know, trips via car. Of course, that doesn't really work across oceans, but, you know, locally. So that's a very interesting, I was fascinated by your chart there with the, um, the quantifiable, the projections on, on those industry segments. Um, let me introduce um, Dr. Gerald McDermott from um, the University of South Carolina. Um, Dr. McDermott is a professor of international business at the Darla Moore School of Business here where he's the faculty director of the Folk Center for International Business, a research, senior research fellow at the IAE Business School in Argentina. Um, he was previously assistant professor of multinational management at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania for seven years. He received his PhD from MIT and Dr. McDermott specializes in international business and political economy, particularly on the issues of innovation, risk, corporate strategy, and institutional change in emerging market countries. Dr. McDermott, thank you for being with us. I know, you know we had talked in advance about um, taking Dr. Bias's kind of global uh, view of this and having your expertise translate this for us to a more national uh, perspective. We're looking forward to that. And I think. All right. I'm. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, that's good. Thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us today, and thank you for this opportunity to share some work. So my background is really on international strategy and innovation, and it's also on economic development in various parts of the world. So. If uh, to a certain degree, you know, Dr. Bias gave you a, a, a really a transnational global perspective on trends in industry and potential trends with supply chains around the world. Um, even though most of my work is on emerging markets, what I'm going to do, because I am here in the flagship school of, of South Carolina, I'm going to give a, try to connect those trends a little bit closer to home, probably um, offering you some information that you already know better than I do, right? Because you, uh, the audience, is in the thick of things. Um, but in, in, in looking at some trends, I will want to uh, accentuate uh, or basically pick up where uh, Professor Vias left off on these issues of, well, what would you do given these trends? And particularly look at some opportunities but also serious issues uh, uh, for South Carolina 
and for South Carolina small and medium sized firms. Um, these are snapshots. It's not in detail. We could get into that. I didn't want to bore you with that. So let me just jump in if that's okay, Suzanne, with, uh, with um, let me just share my screen with everybody. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Where did my screen go? Give me one second. I am all of a sudden I have. We can make you the presenter so that you can share. Wait, hold on a second. Are you, am I, am I a host? You should be. Yes, you are a host. All righty, all righty. So I should Thank be able to can. find my screen. Um, I'm sorry, something is odd because I suddenly can't find my presentation. Uh, oh, I see, I see something. Hold on one second, people. Um, give me one second. I don't know why this is happening. Um, yeah, let's try show all window. There we go. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Wonderful technical difficulties for people who know something about technology. All right. So here's the interesting, so the basic, uh, all the trends that Professor Vias just showed you have a deep impact on the Carolinas in more ways than we think about, even though, you know, you say, well, it's little South Carolina. And I'm just going to show you some, some uh, remind you really of, of what you probably already know. We are, we in South Carolina are among consistently for the last 15 years among the top five states in the union in terms of the intensity of trade and foreign direct investment and therefore jobs created by foreign direct investment and trade. And, and, it, and I'm not gonna go into the other data, which would magnify that, but that is if you look at simply um, trade and investment from within the United States, but outside of South Carolina, these numbers make South Carolina even more dependent on external trade and external investment. And so the question is, what are the trends what do you got to worry about? And how is that going to affect small, medium sized firms, an area of expertise of mine? So just real quick, I'll give you a couple of snapshots. Um, SC, right, like I mentioned, is among the top in the United States. So more than 15% of its GDP is exports alone. Uh, when we get into, you know, so it's 30, more than 30% is exports and imports. So trade matters. So when Dr. Bias, when Professor Bias is saying, hey, there's going to be some decoupling and some changing in, changes in, in supply chains around the world, that could potentially have a big impact on what is going on in South Carolina, right? Um, because don't forget, uh, uh, South Carolina is not just producing things, but they're in, they're, they depend on suppliers and they also depend on logistics. So just to give you an idea again, where does South Carolina make its money? You can see it's basically China plus NAFTA plus the EU. Now I've actually uh, uh, done a lot of work on the EU expansion and on NAFTA over the years. And it's a kind of, it's a, a bit of a mess with NAFTA, but here's the bottom line. The more we make it miserable for Mexico, the more that's gonna hurt South Carolina. Let me just tell you that. And that number on China over here has really dropped. In the last 10 months, trade to China has dropped off almost in half for South Carolina. So that is a big, now it's interesting, by the way, places like South, uh, South Korea, the trade has really increased lately over the last year. I think that's a Samsung effect, uh, but it nowhere near makes up for the trade to China, okay? And if you were wondering, this is just, I'm not gonna go into detail, if you're wondering what was the components, it's all that you people are out there producing, right? So it's aircraft, motor vehicle, uh, and, and other advanced uh, materials, right? So what does that tell you? 
one of the things is these are high knowledge, high value added materials as well. It can be even higher. And that's an important point. So you'd say, what do we need to maintain our position in these more advanced and sophisticated areas? Okay, that's one thing to think about. Now, where's the investment coming from? South Carolina depends tremendously on out-of-state investment. But I can tell you going in as a specialist on this for 30 years, if you think it's about taxes, you lost the game. If you think it's about wages, you lost the game. It's already out. It's all about value creation and innovation. And that's, and, and as these supply chains are shifting around, actually, the competition, even from our neighbors, as I'm going to show you, is going to become even more intense. So here's an interesting question. So we depend on outside investors from outside the state, but especially over FDI. So again, we're a top, top, state in the union that depends on foreign firms investing into our state, right? Over $50 billion over the last 15 years. Our FDI accounts for 8% of the uh, private sector workforce. That's the highest in the United States at a per state basis, per capita basis. Okay, that's created over 140,000 jobs. In fact, the latest numbers were 550,000 jobs on foreign trade and investment. When you combine it all, that's a big number for South Carolina, right? Um, and on, the, on this side, on the right-hand side of your screen and below, you get an idea about where, uh, what, what areas that's affecting. Of course, we're in services. Services are always big at this day and age, but R&D, manufacturing, logistics, that's what's tied to trade. Foreign-owned companies, what are they doing? Manufacturing is mostly where, where the employment's at. Okay, so first thing, just to remind you, when we're playing around in a random way with trade rules and trade relations, guess what? Those little things have a big impact on South Carolina. That is a really, do not underestimate that impact. And if you lose a market uh, for six months, it's difficult to get it back because if they like the new supplier, you know, it's going to be difficult to wedge yourself back in. There's also a relationship. It's not always this case, but for South Carolina, there is an integ in, uh, a correlated relationship, an interactive relationship where those trade ties are also heavily related to those investment coming in. It's not always the case, but in, in the case of South Carolina, Carolina, big foreign investment from top places is very much dependent on our trade lines going out of state, right? Going around the world. So you have to be very careful. That's a great opportunity even more. But who's benefiting? And what are we gonna do about our small, medium-sized firms? So one of the things that, just to give you a benchmark us, SMEs, this is a, a snapshot, but it's pretty consistent over the last, say, 15 years. Okay, about 50% of the economy and employment depends on small, medium-sized firms, pretty similar, if not higher, than our neighbors, right? And if you're getting the share, you know, in, in South Carolina, a lot of it is in logistics and science and tech services, manufacturing. But here's the data that I worry about, and this is also pretty consistent. So when you look at our neighbors, when you look at our neighbors, we have a lot of, they, they have a lot of small, medium-sized firms, and they have a lot of SME exporters as well, just like us. But who's capturing the value? And what's really interesting, and I would be very concerned if I am sitting in the state house, because don't forget what SMEs are. They allow flexibility and they create jobs, okay? And potentially they are better when you have clusters, which I study quite a bit around the world, of SMEs, in many ways, they're more innovative than large vertical firms. So what we could see here is that SMEs are not capturing the export value in South Carolina, particularly compared to their neighbors. North Carolina, Georgia, even Tennessee, where there's a lot of manufacturing, okay? Even Alabama. So that means how, you know, this creates a really big challenge. So now you have this problem where the SMEs are not 
getting their fair share, so to speak. They could be getting more and more value added in the supply chain, but, or in the value chains, okay? And, and there's, now you're also facing with this added uncertainty of trade disruption and COVID. So here are some things to think about going forward, and it touches on Professor Vias's uh, concern about uh, the workforce, human capital, and R&D. Okay, education. We know we're not good. So then why are we always saying we're not good and we're not doing much about it? You know? That would be a basic question, and you're our business leaders, but it's beyond that. You should think about the economy, and especially with SMEs and large firms, not as vertical relationships, but also horizontal. How much are we really integrating our industries with our R&D, you could say knowledge resource institutions? So that could be universities, it could be institutes, and it could be also voca vocational training. These are really, really critical factors when you look at how regions get good and compete around the world. So just to start off, these institutions, these, what drives innovation are these public-private constellations. And one thing you could think about is, for instance, Clemson does work in some areas of engineering and manufacturing, especially automotive. I am surprised since I came here to USC is the, doesn't seem to be a really strategic focus either from industry, the state house, or even from the university on what's the role of USC in the, all these industries and technologies. Where are these joint councils? Okay. And in fact, what do you see? You see consistent cuts by the state house in higher education while our competitors are actually increasing their contributions. Okay. Tech extension. This really goes to Professor Vias's concerns before. If you, largely what goes on is you're competing not just at high end uh, new technologies, but right on the shop, shop floor. And we you all know, and you guys probably know it better than I do, there's been many studies about while there are great opportunities and training going on in South Carolina and North Carolina even, what's happening is that they're not getting enough, enough uh, uh, employees of these skills and they're starting programs and they're not jointly coordinated often and sustaining them right and you could see that sc actually is lagging in its comparisons with its neighbors competitors because don't forget and just to give you an idea so i'm dealing with the latest uh data as of uh, uh, a few months ago two months ago Here's an overall since 2000, um, the FTE is, is, is basically, you know, per person. What you can see is even though uh, they increase tuition, what happens is that the funding per student declined. And I'm going to show you this. Now, in comparison, North Carolina, since the 2008 crisis, that declined a bit, but it basically evened out. It stabilized. Georgia increased. It went down because of the crisis, but then increased its funding per student in technical training. So where are we most recently? We increased a bit over the years, but look where we are. So if you're an outside investor and you're saying, look, I need some really quality workforce, how committed is the state? And it's pretty easy to say, well, man, I'm not sure if South Carolina is really committed, even though they do great stuff up in Greenville. I know the operations up in Greenville, Spartanburg, they're struggling compared to their neighbors, their competitors. They're getting outspent almost two to one at times. And they're definitely below the regional average. So moving forward, you have to think about these issues of, we can come back and talk broadly about decoupling and reshoring. But the question is, what will happen to these industries and SME leadership in terms of reorganizing their capabilities at both the R&D side and in the training side? And that's going to take a much greater level of collaboration between the technical schools, the universities, the state house, as well as uh, the firms themselves. So that's why I say at the end, it's not just about funding, Hey, let's see a public-private strategic council on SC, uh, small, medium-sized firms and advanced manufacturing. It's not just going to be individual efforts. So, all right.
Thank you, Dr. McDermott. I know we are going to talk about reshoring. Um, we'll give you an opportunity to weigh in on that. And I have a lot of questions here already about some of the things that Dr. Baez showed in terms of the decoupling and the global reduction in supply chains that directly tie into some of the data you have on exports. But speaking of exports, um, you know, one of the um, biggest producers of um, our economic exporting uh, economy here is, of course, the tire industry. Um, South Carolina, I believe, still exports more tires uh, than any other state. And that's a nice segue to our uh, third panelist, who I'd like to introduce now. Uh, Julie Branham is the Director of Supply Chain for Michelin North America. Julie's been with Michelin following extensive experience in supply chain and logistics within the pharmaceutical and consumer goods packaging industry. At Michelin, she has experience within supply chain engineering, the development of a center for excellence for process improvement and supply chain operations. A lifelong supply chain professional, Julie has global experience with specific expertise of various disciplines, including deployment, inventory management, tactical planning, logistics, and system optimization and efficiency. Julie earned her Bachelor of Science degree at Ohio State. Julie, thank you for being with us. I'm sure a lot of what you've seen already is has your wheels turning. Um, please give us a little bit of an overview about your role, what you're seeing at Michelin these days. Sure, thank you very much uh, for having me attend today. Um, I wanted to talk just a little bit in, in regards to almost like a case study for what we did with uh, COVID and in 2020, because as a global organization, we quickly saw the effect of China and we evaluated the various economic curves, whether it was a U curve, a W curve, whatever curve it might be, to anticipate what we could expect for 2020. And our first thought um, in the way that Michelin operates is always about employee safety. So we first took an approach of always making sure that our teams were safe in whatever way that we could. And second point of concern was to protect the cash because we did not know absolutely what was going to happen. So. So when we, take, when we think back of where we were just a mere seven months ago in March, uh, which seems so, so very long ago, we launched a crisis evolution for handling of COVID because we do, of course, export quite a bit of tires and we also import quite a bit of tires. But because of our extensive portfolio, we had some product lines that were very immediately affected by COVID, whether it be the automotive uh, industry for passenger tires, but yet our mining tires or our truck tires were not as affected because all of a sudden everybody was receiving all of their goods via Amazon via versus driving to the grocery store. So we had very different economic curves and demand volumes in anticipation of the COVID crisis. So we had to in, um, put in place different guidelines and rules for managing those different types of businesses. So the biggest change though that we put into place was our SNOP process, our management reporting process, everything that we do to link back to our global organization is a monthly process. But a month is way too long within a COVID crisis, within the COVID crisis. So we immediately launched into a weekly prop. Um, process. And that's going to speak to some of the challenges we have and the questions that have been raised previous to this uh, topic is around data analytics. And where do we need to grow our competency in regards to data analytics? Because all of a sudden, within this context of a crisis, we were dealing with monthly data that then we need to extrapolate and figure out how do we interpret that on a weekly basis and make decisions for the best for our employees and for our customers. So it was, it's, it's a very, it was a very evolving and very man, honestly, a very manual process during the start of it because it was all brand new for us as to how to react into this situation. 
So data analytics and data um, to, to drive business decisions is our key priority and was our key priority through COVID. But as we have come out of the, the challenges that within, are within COVID, we also learned that there was a benefit to changing the frequency in which we review data because then we became more agile to try to understand where the market was going. And it, is, and it continues to be very volatile today in anticipation of perhaps a second wave, perhaps a third wave, um, as different parts of the globe shut down or start back up or react differently. Um, we have to deal with, instead of, we are, we are a company of engineers. We deal with very precise numbers. We expect to sell exactly 4,232 tires this month of this one size. Instead of saying, well, wait, we need to have a range to talk about, we could sell between 6,000 and 3,000. And what will that decision drive based on that? So the biggest learnings coming out of COVID were one, the appreciation that uh, I work for a company that absolutely honors employee safety first, because they were not gonna put anybody in a position in which they put themselves in harm's way. Uh, and then the second is the need and urgency for us to react to an emerging market and, and both from a manufacturing process as far as agility and also data evolution. So those are the two biggest opportunities and learnings that we've taken from this and we continue to put it in place today as we continue to evolve out of the COVID crisis and into maybe a life returning to normal. Thanks. Thank you, Julie. So, I'd like to kind of take this, these seeds that you all have planted and, and kind of talk about them a little more specifically. So if we start with Dr. Bias's um, global reduction, your, your projection uh, about the decoupling of the supply chain and so forth, that immediately I think has all of us thinking about um, you know, reshoring operations to the U.S. I expect that we would then also consider the effect that that would have on South Carolina. You know, if I'm thinking about Dr. McDermott's, uh, you know, export, and we know the picture here, right? We are a heavily export-based economy. Um, Dr. Weiss, do you have a, a comment about that? And, you know, the the reduction in global supply chain certainly won't just go in one direction, right? It would go in more than one direction. It could affect us. What, how do you see that affecting South Carolina? Let me just unmute. Okay, uh, okay, I'm un unmuted now. So, so I think, uh, so this decoupling that I spoke about uh, was within the context of staying globalized, but decoupled, specifically decoupled out of China-centric supply chain that we became overly reliant over the last 35 years. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, I think the way I look at the uh, onshoring or nearshoring is within the framework of USMCA. I mean, how we play into uh, between Canada, us and Mexico, to Jerry's point earlier, that we simply cannot afford to marginalize one of the member of this alliance that we have drawn, which was very strong during NAFTA and USMCA. So that, that interdependency needs to be there. The jobs that I think will be onshored, rather, will be highly digitized, highly robotic in terms of advanced manufacturing. Do not believe that we want to get into the business of manufacturing widgets and the plastic bottles unless we can introduce high robotic applications. So the good news is those will be very high paying jobs. Bad news is those numbers are very small in comparison to setting up the traditional manufacturing, which is labor intensive. So from that context, the good news is, I think we're already seeing my data points talking with Fortune 100 to 500 company executives, that has already begun. 
So decoupling re, re, sort of had started. How quickly did we go through this process? I think it depends on the size of the company, their balance sheets, and their vision of how rapidly they can actually not only decouple, but digitize along the way. And to Julie's point, data analytics, AI, ML, artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchains, IoT adoption, all of these things within the framework of digital transformation is what we will probably lead the rest of the world in terms of setting the trend. So Suzanne, that, that's in a sense, I think what I visualize the nearshoring and onshoring will look like. Mexico has a huge opportunity to play a role in absence of what we are where we were so dependent on China. As long as they get their soft infrastructure, governance, corruptions, violence, and all of those things, once they address those and we feel comfortable and private equity goes in there, I think combination of uh, umbrella of USMCA can suddenly benefit and we can bring a lot of good white collar jobs and advanced manufacturing jobs back here at home while depending on some of the medial jobs into the Mexico and so forth. Thank you. And presumably, you know, uh, Dr. McDermott, this is also a place where the SMEs can benefit, right, and can flourish. And we can see an, uh, a growth in that segment of the economy. Um, so Dr. Vias already mentioned one of the risks, which is, you know, the, the digitized, automated, robotics kind of uh, vision that he painted for us means that there are more high paying, although fewer in quantity types of jobs potentially with that. Dr. McDermott, what do you see as some of the risks associated with the, the reshoring? I think you're still muted. Okay. Thanks. Oops. Still muted. Okay, good. I'm Thanks. unmuted now. Yeah. I, I think we hit the thing at the same time. So, um, if we're talking, I, I'll talk about Mex. There's a very interesting question about Mexico going on here, but I will, um, I will put that aside. And as an advertisement, see my latest book, right? That came out actually about this about four years ago, five years ago. But on the small, medium-sized firms. You know, that is South Carolina, if you're thinking about South Carolina, look, it doesn't have large indigenous firms. And, and, and the cold facts of life, and I know you work for Michelin and BMW, and, I, so, and, and they're here, They've turned, they're actually models. But there's huge variation on how foreign firms or, or just outside firms and setting up branch plants it, it, it will behave in terms of the positive spillover effects. And they react, most of the time, they react to our, uh, to, the, to the local actors creating the institutions and, and knowledge infrastructure, you could say, uh, uh, in terms of how much they're going to more and more locate into South Carolina. So, it is incumbent upon the South Carolinian actors and particularly South Carolinian owned firms, small and medium sized firms. I, I look, all due respect to my MNC friends and I study these firms, they, you, the leaders of SMEs, uh, of large firms, uh, subsidiaries are caught between different types of demands, right, and constraints. They, you have to create the mission and the strategy for the region as a local actor. And that is the critical thing I think that is missing in South Carolina. Um, so they are at a stage right now where South Carolina has benefited from many of these arrangements but I just don't see enough. And you could just see it in the data. So what Professor Vias was saying, sort of there's these few high paying jobs and then that's about it. But there's this middle level that South Carolina can move into, right? Where it's not engineering, all engineering jobs, 
but let's just say it's sort of um, advanced employment and, and middle level. But, but if you just look at the training data, Suzanne, if you just look at the training data for the past 20 years in South Carolina, the amount of money that like BMW and, and Siemens in North Carolina have committed to doing training like apprenticeships has been extraordinary. But there's very, very few output, right? So uh, what you would want to do is come up with a, a scheme where there's enough coordination and quasi-regulation so that say uh, the, the uh, community college, uh, technical college system up in um, Spartanburg has a plan in five years essentially to double their uh, student base. But the funding and the coordination with both state actors and uh, uh, firms, especially SMEs, would have to really, really advance. Okay, without that, why am I going to invest more into South Carolina, right? Without a collaboration of USC and doing new R&D with all our engineering buildings around me, I could go somewhere else. So I have a, a follow-up question from the audience for you uh, on that, Jerry, and it is along the lines of, you know, your, your charts show um, pre-COVID, uh, how well we're doing economically, the state's performance. Um, and if we were, you know, and you also make a, a strong case for spending more um, on education, right? Uh, if we were last in performance and last in spending, we could, the uh, attendee says he could see your argument, um, but we're doing very well economically. So how do you make the case? We're spending less, but we're doing well. Depends what level you're looking at, okay? So on a per capita income basis, and when you look at poverty and uh, distribution of wealth, no, we're not doing well at all. And by the way, when you have less knowledge and, and less value added in the parts in your value chain, those are the easier ones to relocate, okay? So what I would say is this, there's been a lot of good work done up to now, but the SME contribution, all, again, all you have to do is say, compared to my neighbors, why are there so many SMEs involved in the economy, yet it's capturing so little value? So that's what I'm saying. And that's an indicator that the supply lines and the supply chains or the, the, the positive knowledge spillovers into the supply chain and also horizontally are not happening as effectively as South Carolina would want to, okay? Um, and I just think that's sort of a crazy argument to say, well, if we're really bad in education, let's just stay really bad because we had a five years of growth. I mean, that's like, you know what? Investors look forward. And if I see my name, you know, I see other opportunities where they're making greater commitments to knowledge and skills. I'm gonna go with those people. So I would be remiss if I didn't point out that the Council on Competitiveness recently um, published an economic impact assessment that updates one from five years ago. And in that, we see some of the things that specifically that Julie and Dr. Bias and Dr. McDermott have, have mentioned already, which is we've seen a shift in specifically logistics and supply chain towards more high tech um, types of jobs and functions within our logistics economy. You may know that there are more than 700 companies doing uh, logistics and supply chain in South Carolina. This is you know really the backbone of our economy when you have MNCs and SMEs you know doing business here. One of the things that's ultimately important is that they can effectively, um, both financially um, and from an infrastructure perspective, move their goods. So there's a measurable difference between five years ago in terms of the workforce and today. And and even there are encouraging signs like high school programs being rolled out for global supply chain and logistics and things like that. So I feel like the direction um, is, is right uh, to, to Jerry's point. 
But let's stay on the topic of human capital uh, for a minute because I thought it was an interesting point that Dr. Bias brought up, right? If we ignore the workforce, uh, we're missing probably the biggest uh, piece of this conversation. Um, how do we develop and retain uh, the right talent throughout the supply chain, specifically to the spoke skills? So Julie, maybe you can comment on this as you and Michelin embarked on your data analytics at the beginning of COVID time. Um, did you find you had everything you needed there in terms of skill sets and so forth? Is that something you can comment on? Sure. It is an ongoing journey for us because as, as the professors have so wise, wisely indicated, uh, we absolutely, it, supply chain is driven from information. I mean, we don't make anything but information. So uh, we have to grow in that capability because the information is, you can almost, you can easily drown in information as well. You know, the, you can, there's so much out there, whether it be market information, internal information, um, and also then in, especially in a crisis situation, the, the, the context is, is ever evolving. So no, we absolutely, um, we do not have all that we need yet within data analytics. Within a challenging economy situation, which we are, we're always challenged with maintaining cost, improving cost, improving um, headcount resources and human capital. That is the one place that we are absolutely investing in is in data analytics and data analytics capability. So of course, we always encourage folks if they have that passion and that interest, we uh, encourage additional education for, for people. We, we fund that for employees to go to. Uh, and it's also an area that we're growing. We do have a digital organization that's located in Charlotte, North Carolina, that we work very closely with because we recognize that digital transformation is absolutely where we need to uh, emphasize and move our strategic vision in that direction. So in short, no, we did not have the data analytics capability within our teams, but we're growing it. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Bias, would you like to talk a little bit about you see the workforce changing? And you know, we've touched on it a little bit, but specifically, you know, sitting inside your organization and the Marshall Center, and what are the what are kind of the top priorities as you see it for skill sets and so forth for the workforce of the future supply chain? So, so Suzanne, this is really <clears throat> very dear and near to my heart because we've gone through this cycle roughly about 30 years ago when manufacturing jobs, you look at the rush belt, right? Jobs actually moved and we, especially our uh, our governing bodies completely fell asleep behind the wheel. And we, 10 years later, we found out that we left this huge population with absolutely very little skills to recapitalize their abilities into the productive economy. I feel if this decoupling continues to happen and it accelerates, then we will create a second wave of this deficit that we need. Julie's talking about data analytics. How many employees we can find today that they would have that skill set? When I talk about digitization of supply chains and robotic manufacturing, where do we find that skill set? Nobody's talking about it. Three, four, five years later, if we continue to boom in that area, which is likely to happen, that's what the trend is leading us to, but where is the capital, human capital to support that? And I am concerned that if we don't do this, we'll create a, a multi-head monster of this problem space that we'll, we won't have an opportunity to react to it. Because it's not like Julie needs 50 people in, with high new skills that she can just train them in three months and put them into the productive workforce. So I think there's a, as a society, as a company, locally, nationally, regionally, we need to work together using the academic institutes, in this case, uh, University of uh, you know, South Carolina, USC, University of Southern California. I am working with the local government, governors, and my engagement with the White House uh, supply chain 
Council, we're promoting this, that there needs to be a very collaborative structure, proactive planning, investment into building this pipeline. Because if we don't do this right way, we'll find ourselves in the short end of the stick. Thank you. Jerry, any comments on that topic? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is, we're, we're, we're sort of complementing each other here. I just want to go back to something uh, to put another type of perspective on this about what's going on with supply chains that Professor Vias is talking about when he's saying decoupling. Right now, I want you to think about it this way. Okay, and, and actually there's some very, very interesting uh, comparative work done. And one example is um, uh, Toyota Honda versus American uh, automotive manufacturers, right? So there is an overall view that a large part of US approach to efficiency and lean was a rather narrow approach where you're dealing with actually limited number of sourcing, right? And very, very narrow. So this is, I've got, I don't want to get technical, but there's something called modularity, right? And, and how we understand technology and capabilities. So a very American approach was getting that narrower and narrower and narrower and thinking that these pieces could be separated. And so I give you a very narrow set of tasks and you just do it and you ex exploit economies of scale and you go down the cost curve. And what that does is it also squeezes your ability to invest into R&D and to training, right? Because your margins are going, you're competing on, on volume, but not, uh, not margin, okay? So this was happening more and more and more. And there's some really good data about how this was happening too with US style supply chains around the world. We hit a shock and those are very, what we call brittle, brittle, and fragile supply chains. Now, what's really interesting is to go back and look that there were some, uh, uh, let's just say disasters or emergencies with, in, in automotive and Japanese automotive. And by the way, the Germans have paid a lot more attention to the Japanese than, than to the Americans on, on this stuff. And, and, and these emergencies realized that they were the leaders. Remember, they're the leaders of lean production. They started to realize that they had to rethink how they understand their relationships with their suppliers. And that's where this is going. So what, when he's saying we're all in this together, it's not about the technology. Technologies come and go. We determine the use of technology. Technology does not drive us. But the Japanese realized they needed partners who, first of all, had scope and flexibility to do not just something really narrow, but do something very well, but also a little bit on the right, a little bit on the left, if they had to be agile and, and, and be innovative in that way. And that changed a lot about how they thought about their supply chains, but it also has made them extremely agile. So part of the decoupling that Prof Professor Vias is, is, is talking about for the US is how do we actually think about our agility? And I'll go back, guess what? One of the things we know is that strong SME clusters actually are some of the most vibrant ecosystems in the world and the most agile. And that's another opportunity then in the Carolinas because that's really what we have. Right. I mean, if you think about simply take the example of the numerous companies in South Carolina who you know, the word term has become overused to have pivoted from manufacturing automotive or aerospace products during COVID to manufacturing PPE, right? I mean, there were several hundred companies that ended up doing that, right? So that's a nice segue and transition to uh, kind of a, a more narrow focus uh, on the the way that we think about just in time, for example. And, and I remember this from, you know, time in the automotive industry where, you know, your biggest um, concern or impact came from a natural disaster, right? Yeah. You had a supplier, you know, knocked out because of a tsunami or a hurricane or, you know, some kind of weather related instance. Uh, then later we saw, 
you know, a few years ago during the trade agreement um, negotiations, you had trucks lined up for three days on the border, right? So those were the kinds of interruptions we saw. Do you think that there's a um, real possibility to change the way, further change the way we think about just-in-time suppliers and just-in-time, you know, management? Uh, Do you want me to take that first? Sure. Okay. So so one of the things I was trying to make before is that we are taught that there's this thing called lean production. We're taught that there's this thing called just in time, right? All these things. And there's only one way to do it. Well, it turns out there's a lot of different ways to do it. So those concepts that you're talking about actually do create this so so the problem of our supply chains right now and not getting stuff overseas or things like that because of the disruption with covid isn't because of lean per se or just in time per se it's how we have interpreted it and how we teach it and how we collaborate and talk about it and my point is simply if you look at the analysis of the japanese automotive supplier systems over the last 20 years there's it's amazing how they interpreted and understood these concepts like lean and just in time and sourcing and what it means to have different tiered suppliers in very different ways than say u.s manufacturers and suppliers and that creates an opportunity to to learn from so yeah just in time will still be important like speed but what do we mean by do we really need like um non-redundancy right are we locked into an old way is 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 simply when we talk about flexibility in the united states and and just in time is that just a new age way of saying hey it's old mass production from 100 years ago i mean that's not an innovation we have to evolve beyond that and that's not where value added is going to be by the way yeah if we want to go into compete on scale we'll do some things but you know the Chinese are going to wipe you out on that one. So we better. We, we our game is way ahead of uh, uh, others in terms of the combination of scale and innovation. Okay, that's where our game is. Julie, in sitting inside a, a global concern, um, you must have more than one, not just a U.S. perspective on this. How are you? How are you thinking about these kinds of concepts and shifting of of these types of what we would typically, you know, consider fundamental supply chain concepts. So it's definitely moving and shifting as you indicate. Um, I absolutely agree there is, so I am with you, just in time, we used to always talk about, you know, the natural disasters and and, um, it's certainly one we try to guard against and have plans in place to react. But for, for, for me, um, I'm a big believer that you can only have just in time if you have all of the corresponding background information and agility and flexibility within your manufacturing process to allow for you to be just in time. Uh, it takes, it was certainly um, groundbreaking at its time to talk about the removal of, of inventory uh, redundancies, but then it puts the onus somewhere within the chain to be able to respond to a shift. And that is exactly some of the challenges we've experienced this year because the shift in the market, uh, no one anticipated, no one expected. In fact, we've used the word that the markets have rebounded violently for us specifically, um, either through the economic stimulus that was provided to consumers that then said, I'm going to spend that resource on durable goods or the fact that no one is air traveling and they're choosing to buy tires or buy a freezer or buy or redo their kitchen. Uh, It's put a lot of emphasis and need on that area of of manufacturing, which I think today now is struggling because of that, because that volume shift and change uh, affected each commodity differently. So um, I think that, I I think it's gonna be a very interesting evolution as we move over. For me, I think it's the next four months are gonna be very interesting. And I do think it has widened, it has opened uh, eyes and provided some clarity about 
where should our stakes be? Where should our insurance be regarding inventory and our flexibility and agility to respond to that? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a work in process actually for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just want to remind the attendees that we just have a few more minutes um, for them to submit questions via the chat. I am looking at it. Um, otherwise, I get to have all the fun, <laughs> and this is fun for me. Um, I wanted to I wanted to talk about the the data analytics again, Julie. I like the way Julie um, kind of phrased this, where she said, "You know, we're." it's so easy to have too much information, right? So sometimes you have a lot of data, but it doesn't always have a one-to-one -one information value. And sometimes, you know, companies, we've seen companies that are kind of headed down the digitization journey, um, be overwhelmed, you know, and kind of big data has now evolved into what we think of as, you know, ideally it's more sophisticated than that and it's smart data. Um, one of the things that certainly will be um, more and more important, even in a, in a shifting supply chain as, as we're discussing now is the security of the supply chain, right? Um, maybe all of the panelists can just comment quickly on, you know, do you see in the with the companies that you're working with, either in the state or uh, Dr. Bias, you know, around the US or, or Julie, do you see more and more of a focus on kind of the blockchain cyber uh, technology input? Is it, is it as much of a significant topic for you today as you know, one would think given you know, a lot of the efforts and, and outreach about it? Um, Julie, do you wanna start? Uh, sure. Um, so blockchain we are exploring uh, because we do have significant amounts of data that we would like to deliver in a more synthetic vantage point. Uh, but we're very, very, very young in our evolution. So I think that there are many more advancements being done in other organizations. Dr. Bias, is, is this something you talk about in the White House Council? Tell us, uh, so, tell us everything they're thinking about. So I wrote a book last year uh, called the Blockchain in Supply Chain uh, with my colleagues. And we're doing some extensive work in this field. Uh, just over the summer, I work with the pork industry in the US mm -hmm. and we explore uh, blockchain in pork industry, how food sustainability uh, and security is going to be a huge concern. Right, so the folks I'm talking to, the CEOs in Asia, that's their concern about the supply chain and digitization. But one of the biggest lessons they learned that if we don't protect our food supply chains, then you can have a massive civil war uh, with the lack of access of basic necessity. Right, uh, from that standpoint, I think there are incredible advancements being made in digital frontier. To the degree, I would say that if you stay asleep on this, you may wake up a year later and you find the competition has completely moved into the different quadrant. So the acceleration, the evolution, especially during COVID and post is going to be rapid and Agility of tomorrow, resiliency of tomorrow, security of your supply chains of tomorrow will be underpinned by strong digital platform. These platforms are not just blockchain, use of AI, ML, integration of IoT and, and built-in dynamic data analytics capability. So the decisions are made. Tomorrow's SNOP, organization, procurement sourcing, your replenishment organization, your decision makings of your sourcing strategy will be driven through this advanced analytics modules that they're driven and underpinned by that. And, and this is what I am really focusing on 
in one end, I'm so excited and I'm leading this in, uh, from our center, a lot of research and use cases. But then I look at the implication in human capital and that, so I'm excited on one end and I'm nervous on the other because mm -hmm. they two are completely contradicting and we, as a, somebody is going to be, eventually have to address this issue. And I would think just, you know, I was thinking about when you mentioned the food supply chain, I mean, you know, we have yet to go through the process of distributing vaccines at a global, you know, national and then global level, right? I mean, that could also be a very, well, it promises to be challenging, right? Depending on the nature of the vaccine and whether they need to be, you know, cold stored and all those things. But yes, I would think the pharmaceutical and the food supply chain could both be as Oh, it's incredible, Suzanne. And you think about it, seven and a half billion population in our country, 336 million people, the temperature requirement and the, and the vaccine distribution. I mean, I wrote about this in my blog a couple of weeks ago, uh, post-COVID blog that I wrote. It's a huge concern. It's not a small feat. I mean, look at the temperature requirement of this thing. I mean, we have done a good job of flu vaccine, but we've been doing that for 25, 30 years. So we have learned over the years and perfected the supply chain. Mm -hmm. COVID, I think it's uh, uncharted territory. So yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I have a question for uh, Jerry. Um, are there good opportunities for smaller companies within the supply chain advances and changes that we're talking about here? Yeah, let me, let me, uh, I just, before I address that, I would just want to jump in on something that was uh, uh, Professor Vias, and it's interesting, he brought up food and food safety. Um, first of all, if you really want to know how did Toyota really develop its, its lean, uh, uh, lean production, um, lean manufacturing system, it actually looked at uh, uh, food supply chains. Uh, and fresh produce. So in many ways, uh, food and fre anything that needs to be kept fresh are on the cutting edge of, of the safety as well as um, high quality supply chains. The second thing that, about that is that it actually, we did a study a couple years ago for many, many years and we continue to do it, looking at um, produce and meat uh, sources of supply chains from Mexico into well, NAFTA and basically the EU. And um, that, it's an incredible insight. Basically, the EU has leapt in front of everybody because of their farm to table system because of the mad cow disease. Just like uh, SARS really trained the Taiwanese and the Koreans, et cetera, to really get prepared for what's happening now, that mad cow disease, which was a disaster, reinvented how they understood supply chains. So we can learn you know, now from one another. I think, I think that was the, that's one of the big things. And where do small firms? Well, one of the things is that if you look at those supply chains, the ones that work, supply, you know, of course, small firms are involved in, in all these areas. There's no reason, and there's no natural course. It's very important to understand that there's no natural reason. There's no inherent reason why everything goes from small to large and then wipes out the small. There's not, there's, there's very little evidence of that. Okay, it's actually, it varies quite a bit. So the opportunities for a place like the Carolinas and particularly South Carolina is to start thinking of their small firms as part of how do we build an ecosystem around a certain set of capabilities and technologies, right? That's, that's, that's the starting point. So uh, something like food safety, of, of course, is a huge public-private object of, 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 of venture right? Uh, skills development and technology development, uh, trade competitiveness, those are multiple actors. And so where small firms, uh, one of the big things is to try to see how small firms, look, the better clusters and ecosystems in the world have very well organized small and medium-sized firms in these different technologies. They're organized together, not just as individuals. They're organized together and they're figuring out what their common problems are and their strategic needs are. And then they go and try to address them with other types of institutional actors. Thank you. Um, we have a question that's very interesting, I think, about um, impact to the consumers. I, I happen to be personally trying to replace an ice maker. Um, my order from Lowe's 
uh, went from being delivered in July to being delivered in October to now being delivered next January. And I've been talking to a lot of other people that are having the same thing, uh, same experience with appliances um, and delays due to interruptions in production and appliances. Um, and the question is, you know, what can all of you comment a little bit on, you know, what bottom line impact of supply chain challenges and opportunities do you see to consumers as we roll out at the end of this year? I'm, do we need to be hoarding toilet paper or what are we, where do you see the, the impact to the consumers? Jerry, you're, you're already on, so why don't you- No, I, I would say that, that's, a, that's something I, 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 I'm at a loss as much as you. I think uh, Professor Vias may know the uh, intricacies of supply chains uh, much better than I would. Uh, sure. Thanks, Jerry. So I think, uh, so I am certainly of the belief that we, if the second wave were to spike and coincides with our typical flu season, right? You can only imagine the confusion that will create symptoms, differentiations between COVID versus flu and, and a rush, that psychological trigger will drive some of the hoarding mindset we saw from essential commodities. So there is already inventory being built in anticipation for that, mm. right? Now, Suzanne, to your point, uh, it changes. It depends on which week this will trigger and coincides with the peak seasons, uh, can have a likely impact on the shortages and, and safety stocks and available uh, supply on this. If we look at it, the disruption is not going to be because it's a supply or uh, base, but it's strictly going to be demand based because we will buy more than what we need for the time that we need. So you no longer will stock up toilet paper for a week or two or three. It'll be three months, six months. And that's what probably what will put the strain again mm -hmm. on those essential commodities. And we have seen that. And I think we're likely to see that uh, if those two flu and flu as well as COVID second wave were to sort of a coagulate together, I think we can have a very interesting supply chain challenges again. Julie, any thoughts on where you see challenges to this? Sure. Um, interesting is my least favorite word around supply chain challenges, just because that's uh, that's the life I'm in right now from a supply uh, shortage standpoint. So, because uh, we're right there with all of the ice manufacturers and the refrigerator makers and things like that. So, um, it's we, again though our first priority, and it's clear that we will protect our employees first. So, if there is a second wave. Um, or when there is a second wave, depending upon who you think about it. We, we certainly have taken steps around uh, ensuring that our teams are safe, but that will be our first priority. So we will um, first protect them and then, uh, and then we'll adjust to the demand as it comes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Someone commented uh, in the chat that my ice maker story underscores the problems of global supply chains and producing Absolutely. <laughs> consuming eliminates this. Um, I have one more, I'm going to take one more question um, from the chat because I think it's interesting. It's um, probably best suited for Jerry or Julie, um, and it is, how does the infrastructure growth and the investments we're seeing in infrastructure, things like the dredging of the Charleston Harbor and for the port um, to allow for the bigger ships, uh, look to help uh, the upstate industry? I, Julie, I know Michelin just had a big announcement about using the inland port here. And right, but the, the dredging, we were certainly an advocate for that because it changed the game in regards to some of the vessels we could use. So we were a, a, a huge advocate of that work done. Uh, we, we expect the upstate to continue to be a thriving economy in regards to the global needs. There is ambitions for us to repatriate some things, but as uh, as previously indicated, it's not so quick to be able to do with some of our capital intensive manufacturing organizations across the world. 
So um, we will continue to optimize that port and other ports uh, to our fullest ability. Thanks, Julie. Jerry, do you have some thoughts on this as well, particularly for the upstate? You know, um, I, I think when you, if you want to benchmark the country and the region, that's what you would do, right? So you try to figure out where it is. So these are all important moves, but um, I would say this, when I'm thinking of big infrastructure issues and we're going with 5G um, and things like that, I, I think that accessibility and consistency really needs to be a priority and how you, uh, it's not, it's not compared to other leading countries and the models aren't. So that's why uh, I would be doing that. The other thing is there still is this big issue about rail. And, and I mean that as a major infrastructure issue for the survivability of the industry if we're going, and the region, because the region will still have some growth demographically, but this uh, reliance on, with all due respect to Michelin, and Michelin's great and BMW is great and so is Volvo, but really, um, you know, it's sort of like this big, we're, we're trying to like uh, uh, play around with the edges. So the, the, the sort of leap that's needed in infrastructure for both commercial and, and, and households is, is, is really considerable. And I think that everybody keeps waiting for the federal government to come in. And to a certain degree, it, 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 that'll be needed. But it's really the states got to coordinate that because the states compete as much as anything on regional infrastructure. So nobody has that sort of global, you know, the, the infrastructure is very, very regional. It's not like global for the US. And in fact, the way the United States is configured, most of the power uh, actually is in, in the hands of the states. So I think that's gonna be a big table. You know, the governors need to get together from this, these regional states and sort of really figure this out. What's their, you know, because you're in the upstate, you know, the upstate is like, is it, is it really part of Columbia or is it part of this collaboration with, you know, your neighboring states. Like Perfect. that's how you start to think of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. I could just enjoy continuing this conversation with our panelists. Thank you all so much. Um, on behalf of the World Affairs Council Upstate, uh, Upstate SC Alliance and the European American Chamber of Commerce Carolinas, um, the World Affairs Council would like to thank the panelists for participating in today's event. They'd also like to thank the media sponsor, Upstate Business Journal. Um, they hope that you will register for the first event in their America and the World Conversation series on October 13th at noon, titled, Will Democracy Survive the 2020 Election? For more information, please visit their website at upstateinternational.org. Thank you, everyone. Thoroughly enjoyed spending some time with you today. Thank you.